Namaste. 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 The wind is blowing, the doors are banging, it must be summer. <laughs> no? <laughs> so, um, I had this, uh, I was accused last night, by the way, of saying radical things. <gasps> I, I was <laughs> scandalized myself. <laughs> but I, I wanted to talk about Midrash today because these two readings are an excellent example of Midrash, which is why I bookended the little complicated explanation of Midrash with the readings. And the image that I chose for today, because I, I came up with the, the, this catchy little title, Midrash, it's not just for breakfast anymore, because it kind of sounds like the name of a breakfast cereal. You know, it's not that far from like, that's that stuff called miso, Musilix, Musinex, all that stuff. And so, when I wanted to find an image to match it, I just Googled Midrash and breakfast, and learned that in Judaism, there are groups of people that get together to do Midrash over breakfast, not unlike our Bible study meetings. So I, see, synchronicity. Yes, that's there are, exactly there, what it is. There are no acts. True. So Midrash, so why is it important, who cares? Um, so that's this group having, having Midrash? Yes, so that is a Midrash breakfast meeting. Because I didn't recognize any of these. No, I'm. I was I, trying to play something. I'd like to tell you I took the picture. Well, the guy sitting there with his arm on the table looks like Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> you need your glasses fixed. I was going to say. No one else knows The ginger? Anyway, it's the here and there. Midrash is kind of the opposite idea of literalism. Mid Midrash says that what is between the lines is at least as important as the lines. Midrash says that what's printed, written there, or later in history printed there, isn't the whole story. And Midrash says that everything that evangelical biblical scholarship has done in the last 150 years is a load of nonsense. Because Midrash says, or reveals the truth, that these authors did not write literally. They were not writing newspaper accounts. Sometimes, in the Old Testament history books, you might argue that they were. But what's really interesting is that last paragraph of the second reading, it talks about how Midrash started orally and wasn't written down until the second century. And of course, that's the 100s of the Common Era. And the gospel writers wrote late in the aughts of the common era, 70, 80, 90, in when Midrash was present and active and going on. And so some of these stories that we get in the gospels have parallels in the Old Testament, and it becomes really important sometimes to, to look at the parallel because they're trying to say something about Jesus by telling us a story about Elijah and recasting Jesus as the character. Now, who cares about Elijah? Well, remember the story of the transfiguration. Elijah and Moses are present. In Hebrew thought, there's three kinds of writing in the Hebrew Bible, but most important are the law, first five books, and the prophets. Elijah was like the super prophet of Old Testament times. There's a reason, we talked about it on Transfiguration Sunday, that the reason that Moses and Elijah appear on the, on the mountain with Jesus, dressing fabulously, is that <laughs> They're saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of the prophets. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Elijah is a big deal. And so if you're writing to a Jewish audience and you want to say, Jesus is a big deal, one of the ways to do it to a Jewish audience at the time was to cast Jesus doing the things that Elijah did. Bringing 
people back to life, sometimes feedings, just before this story in Kings, the previous story, Elijah shows up at the same widow's house and says, make me something to eat, and there's nothing there, and so Elijah works a miracle whereby the flour and the oil don't run out until this drought that's going on is broken. Kind of like, say, taking 12 fishes, or, or, or two, two, fish and two fish and five loaves, and having 12 baskets left over to feed 5,000 men, and the women just looked on hungrily. <laughs> and the kids whined. And the kids whined. And there were 12 baskets left over, which is a reference to Israel, the 12 tribes. So, so there's, there's all this rich symbolism in here that in 2016, I mean, it just, to us, it, it, unless you've studied it, it's hard to know that it's there. And it may or may not be useful to you. But what I want to say is it would be a mistake to believe that Christianity was the only tradition that was writing its stories and doing versions of Midrash. People remember stories. People tend to have a harder time remembering wise pearls cast out. Because there's something about our memory that works better with stories. And so, particularly in an oral tradition, when the person who was telling the story had to remember the story because they couldn't write it down, or they didn't have books to carry them around with, they, they used these stories as teaching devices, and then all of a sudden, Western Christianity comes along some 2,000 years later, not quite 1900, maybe 1850, and starts saying, oh, these are newspaper accounts. And starts saying that whatever you do, don't play with this. But it's okay to play with it. I, I'm going to say you have to play with it. And you have to play with it if for no other reason than you, you're going to have to play with it some to make it relevant for you today. Unless you're really into um, biblical history, which is a fine thing to be into. I'm kind of into it myself. But I recognize that most people aren't. Unless you really like to play games like Bible trivia, which I don't. But some people do, and it's a fine thing to do. The little minute details don't matter. The question is, can you turn it around and draw the moral from the story? Like we talked about last week in Memorial Day and parading phallic things and how if you took the power away from the people who had the phallic things, maybe we wouldn't need phallic things to shoot at other people who had phallic things. <laughs> that's, that's a kind of midrash. Yeah, we can just let everybody go to the bathroom. There's nothing that's so sacred that we have to hermetically seal it and never touch it or look at it, like the china, you know. Lock it up, don't look at that. Because once we do that, it becomes something to look at and not something that's very helpful. You're probably better off buying a nice piece of art. In the Jewish tradition, when a scroll that's used in their services wears out, they have a special cabinet they put it in. They don't throw them away because that would it's thought to not be paying due respect to the scroll. But it, it goes in the corner in the cabinet and a new one is brought out. And, and to me that's always kind of reflected this dual truth that you can have something that's of great value and you can treat it with great respect and you can use it until it gets worn out and it's okay. So you can take a sacred story and manipulate it and poke at it. And yes, sometimes people come away with some pretty crazy stuff. I still have not manifested my Escalade in the driveway. <laughs> Put all the positive thoughts out into the universe and it's not there. But while it's easy to make fun of that, 
There's something about going too far that's necessary so that we know where the edge is. You know, now hopefully we're not talking about a literal edge and a cliff, but even then there's something about walking up to that edge and peering over it that teaches us where we're safe and what is useful. What can we do that benefits us and what just gets into silliness. And the first thing you have to do is relax. It's okay. People make mistakes. It's no big deal. We can be gentle with it. We don't have to be so, forgive me, tight-assed about the whole thing. If it's, if spirituality is a living, breathing thing, and I believe it is, then we have to relax or we strike, choke the life out. Over the last few days, people have asked me things in different contexts about why does this happen, why does this happen, and, and talking about an unsatisfactory religious background. And the answer is always, or the question is always about something where there was too much restriction put on. Where it was, whether we're talking about, sometimes it was sexuality, sometimes it was other teachings. And, and see, the problem is, I think, when we don't let ourselves go, we usually start out restricting ourselves for a very good reason. And then we get some distance from the reason, and we don't really remember what it was, and the whole point becomes, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's religious guilt. And it serves no purpose. We're like children that have never been allowed out of the yard. I have experience with that. Um, the fourth grade chicken pox epidemic that never was, but that's for another day. Um, <laughs> that's right. But if we don't get out of the yard, when we finally do get out, we manage to escape, we're first of all ill-equipped to handle what we encounter, and second of all, we're going to just go crazy. So, why not take the things that people tell us are sacred? Why not take the stories that they tell us are important and truthful and life-giving and then discover for ourselves how they become useful for us. And if they're useful for somebody else in a different way, that's fine. Good for them. But we need to figure out, each of us, how they inform our lives. And if they don't, we stop reading that story and move on to one that